Now let's talk about some specific types of sequences. The first type will be arithmetic sequences. And you can think of it as adding your way to infinity. Okay, let's start with this. Let's start right with the definition. And then we'll look for some properties of this such a sequence. Let's suppose we have letters A and D are real numbers. Okay? An arithmetic sequence. Notice how I'm pronouncing that. It's not arithmetic. It's arithmetic. An arithmetic sequence. Okay. And sometimes there's an older name for this. It's sometimes called an arithmetic progression, if you see that in an older book. But that's no longer used except to refer to older books. So we'll call it an arithmetic sequence. It has the standard form that looks like this. Here it is if I write it out. A would be the first element. That's what the A is here, where the sequence starts. And how do you get to infinity? How do you get all of the other terms? You add your way to infinity using this D letter. So the next is A plus D. The next is A plus D plus D, which is A plus 2D. And then A plus 3D, etc. And that's how you get yourself a sequence by adding your way to infinity starting with a given number A and using D, another given number, to add on and keep on uh, as you as keep on writing up more and more terms. And this is additive, okay? Meaning, we want to write this out a little bit more clearly perhaps, that A1 is equal to A. Now this is the first term. Then AN plus 1 is equal to the previous one, a n plus d. And this is going to be true for n equal 1, 2, 3, out to infinity. Now what is this? This is what we've called before a recursive definition. Okay? I'm defining a n plus 1 in terms of the previous a n, not in, in terms strictly of n. Okay? I'm saying in terms of previous a n. Uh, the D, by the way, let's see, this D here is called the common difference. Common difference. That's where the D comes in. Okay? And we'll see more of this as we go. Since we have a recursive definition as the natural definition of an arithmetic sequence, at some point we'd like to get an nth term formula, a direct definition, and we will be getting to that soon. Okay, let me first make a remark here that notice that since a n plus 1 equals a n plus d, then of course if we solve for d, d then is equal to a n plus 1 minus a n. And remember that's the later one minus the earlier one. So d is equal to a n plus 1 minus a n for all n. So n equal 1, 2, 3. So if you want to figure out what d is, take two consecutive elements of the sequence and just simply subtract the larger one, subtract the one right before it. Okay? So this allows us, this gives us, gives us a test to see if a sequence is arithmetic. Okay? Because if it is arithmetic, then if you take this difference anywhere, this works for any n, remember, you take this difference anywhere, you will always get the same constant. Okay? So let me do an example here and ask the question, is this an arithmetic sequence? Arithmetic? Question mark. And here's the sequence, the sequence 3n plus 5. Well, to check that, I will do a n plus 1 minus a sub n. And if I get a constant, then I know that it, that is the common difference and that this is an arithmetic sequence. Well, a n plus 1 is 3 times n plus 1 plus 5. Remember, this is really 3 box plus 5. And when we go from n to n plus 1, the n is replaced by n plus 1 minus 3 n plus 5. 
Well, that's an easy one. In here, we have a 3n minus a 3n over here, so the 3n's are gone. What's left in here is 3 plus 5, which is 8, minus 5 here. And so we end up with a 3, which we can call d. So the answer is yes. This is indeed an arithmetic sequence. So that's a quick way to check that a sequence is arithmetic. Now, this formula, this original formula, as I said, was a recursive way of defining an arithmetic sequence, a n plus 1 in terms of a n and d. What I'd like to have is a more direct formula. So we'll have a theorem which will tell us that direct formula. And we'll call this the, and I'll even put in parentheses here, the direct, as opposed to recursive, nth term formula for an arithmetic sequence, because that's what we're looking at, an arithmetic sequence. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about in this theorem, and it goes like this. If you have a sequence, a n, that's arithmetic, so if a n is an arithmetic sequence, Okay, so it has a common difference and that definition with uh, first term A and common difference, common D for difference, common difference D, two real numbers, then here it comes, here is the nth formula, the nth term formula that's direct that is dependent only upon n and these numbers a and d, but not dependent upon a sub n or a sub n minus 1 or any previous term. The nth term, the nth term is a sub n equals a plus n minus 1 times d. And I won't prove this, but if you remember how the sequence went, just recall what the sequence looks like. A, A plus D, A plus 2D, etc. And then think about what it means here. If you want A sub 1, then you put a 1 in for N, that makes this 0, you just get A, and that's what you have here, the first A. If you want A sub 2, the second term, you put a 2 in here, that gives you 2 minus 1, which is 1, so you have a plus d, and that's what we have here. If you want a sub 3, 3 minus 1 is 2, a plus 2d is this term here. So you see that, that although this is not a proof, it certainly suggests why this is the right form. So this formula is the nth term formula that is direct for an arithmetic sequence. It's something you need to know. So, for example, you might know that um, you have an arithmetic sequence, okay, that is given to you, and you know that A, the first term, is 2, and that D, the common difference, is 4. What is A sub n? What is A sub n given those two numbers? Well, the solution to that is easy. A sub n by the previous theorem is A plus n minus 1d. And A is 2 plus n minus 1 times d, which is 4. And you just multiply that out. That's 2 plus 4n minus 4. So you end up with 4n minus 2. And that is your A sub n. And so the sequence becomes the sequence 4n minus 2. And that is your arithmetic sequence. So. With all of that in mind, and the formula now for the nth term directly given, it's time for you to try a problem. Let me pose one to you here. Suppose you're given the following information. The eighth term of an arithmetic sequence is 75. The twentieth term is 39. What is the first term of this arithmetic sequence? It's common difference, D, and the nth term formula. So I want you to think about all of those, and I'll come back in a moment, and we'll continue talking about it.
Okay, I hope you have had success with this problem. Let's see what I'm going to do with this. First thing I did was recall the formula for the nth term of an arithmetic sequence in terms of its first and uh, first term and uh, a common difference d. Now let's write down what I know. I'm given the following. I'm given that there, there's a term that is number 75. That I was told was a sub 8. The eighth term of the sequence was 75. Well, with this formula, that means that this is a plus 8 minus 1 times d. Now look at what I have here. Ignoring the a sub 8 here, I have a constant. I have a and d. I have an equation in two variables, a and d. I am going to be building a system, therefore. Likewise, I'm told that 39 is the 20th term, a sub 20. So that's going to be a plus 20 minus 1 times d. OK? Well, with that in mind, I can rewrite this now in the standard form that I like to work with. The top one becomes a plus 7d equals 75, reorganizing that. And the second one becomes a plus 19d equals 39. OK? So I have my two equations, column equation 1 and 2. And what I want to do here is solve this system. I want to find an a and a d that will satisfy both of these at the same time. So I'm going to use my usual process. I am going to replace, say, 2 by minus 1 plus 2. Because I know that if I multiply this by minus 1 and add it, that will get rid of this a, leaving this an equation only in d. And that will certainly make me happy. So I'll go to the next page here and compute my minus 1 plus d. So my minus 1 plus d is the minus 1 is minus a minus 7d equals minus 75. Then the 2 is a plus 19d equals 39. Remember, I'm trying to add these. That's what the plus here means. By design, again, let me mark that out. That's by design in my system. This adds to 0. What else do I get here? I get 12d left over here. And then 39 minus 75 is a minus 36. And of course, I immediately simplify this by dividing by 12. So I see that d is minus 3. So d is the common difference. Now, remember we said that d could be any real number. So don't feel bad that this is a negative number. Common difference can be negative. OK, well, if I have d now, I can substitute or back substitute, to be exact, back substitute this d equals minus 3 into any equation that I saw before. So let's go into, as I look back, into, say, 1, which was fairly simple. And I will have a plus 7 times d, which is minus 3, equals 75. Well, with that in mind, I have then 7 times minus 3 is minus 21. Bringing that to the other side, I get a is equal to 75 plus 21, so a is equal to 96. Well, I have a and I have d, so I can go ahead and write the final question. Remember, I was going to look for the first term. OK, that's what this is. This is the first term, remember. And this d here is the common difference. OK, that was two of the things we were asked for. And then we were asked for the, the nth term for this particular sequence. And that's going to be a n is equal to a plus n minus 1 d, the standard form. And now I put in the a and d, I know. 96 plus n minus 1 times minus 3. And simplify. Uh, 96 minus 3n plus 3. So I have 99 minus 3n. And so if I wanted to write the sequence, it would be the sequence of 99 minus 3n. And there you go. We've answered that question. And I hope that that's what you got. Uh, and that you feel more confident about arithmetic sequences.
And this will be the theorem for the nth partial sum of an arithmetic sequence. Arithmetic sequence. Now this is another one that I'm not going to prove because that would take us too far afield, but I will give you the formula and so that you can practice it on your own. Uh, frankly, arithmetic sequences are not nearly as important to us as geometric sequences, which will be coming up in the next segment. So although you want to practice this material on arithmetic sequences for a variety of reasons, don't treat it as heavily as you will the, would the geometric sequence material coming up. So if a sub n, let's finish this out, if a sub n is an arithmetic sequence, okay, and uh, I'm going to have to list with first term, say a and common difference d, common difference d, then here's what the nth partial sum will look like. I'll give you two formulas for it. It's nth partial sum is S sub n, of course, is the standard terminology for that. And there are two ways to write this, depending on what you know. It's either n over 2, 2a plus n minus 1d. Now, you'd use that formula if you knew the first term and you knew the common difference. Or you can write it as n over 2a plus a sub n. Now, this is a case where you knew the first term, but you don't know the common difference. You do know, however, the nth term. Now, it doesn't matter which one you use. Either one is fine. It's just a matter of which kind of uh, information you're currently given. So let me do one example to illustrate this. And then we'll s end this segment on arithmetic sequences. So find S sub n for the sequence 3n plus 5, which we earlier established was arithmetic. OK, so you want to recall here that a is equal to 8. Well, that's easy to figure out. If n is 1, this is 3 plus 5, so a is equal to 8. And our previous work established that d was equal to 3 here. So with that in mind, there are two ways to compute this. S sub n is n over 2 times 2a plus n minus 1d. That's just the formula. Substituting in n over 2 times 2 times 8 plus n minus 1 times 3. And then that would be n over 2 times, let's see, we have 16 here. And then a minus 3, we have 13 plus 3n. And that's where I would stop, unless I needed to simplify it further for some other reason. And I can use the other formula, too. I didn't have to use this one, but this one was handy. OK. Well, that's how you find the sum of an arithmetic sequence. And on that note, we'll stop and come back and talk about the more important type of sequence to us, the geometric sequences. Well, we've talked about arithmetic sequences, but now we're going to talk about geometric sequences, which are really mathematically much more interesting. So, geometric sequences, multiplying your way to infinity. And let's go ahead and start by getting a definition here. Definition. And this will be very much like the one for arithmetic sequences, except that multiplication will be involved. So let's suppose we have a and a number r in the real numbers, where, and you'll see why, we choose r not to be 0. So we'll keep that in mind, and I'll show you why that's going to be true. OK, here is the definition then a geometric sequence, and I'll also explain why it's called geometric in just a moment. A geometric sequence has the standard form, and so we can keep track of these, the standard form that looks like this. It is the sequence a, a times r, a times, I'll put a times in there, r squared, a times r cubed, etc., all the way out to infinity. That is the form of a geometric sequence. And if you remember, the arithmetic sequence was where we added a d to the a. 
So we went from A to A plus D, A plus 2D, A plus 3D, etc. This time we're multiplying, so we have powers as we go. Meaning, let's say what we mean here, that A1 is equal to A. And of course, that's what we'll refer to as the first term, because that's what it is. And then A n plus 1 is simply the previous one A n times this number r. And you can see why we're choosing r not to be 0 here, because if r is 0, then all these other terms turn out to be 0. And this is a very uninteresting sequence. And this will be true for all n equal 1, 2, 3, et cetera, out to infinity. And as you recall, this kind of a definition is a recursive formula a recursive formula. So we will want a direct formula a little bit later as we did for the arithmetic sequence. One last note while I'm here. This R that we're using has a name. It's called the common ratio. Common ratio, that's where the R comes from. Common ratio, just like for arithmetic sequences, we had a common difference with a D for difference. We have a common ratio, R, for a ratio. And I'll show you also why it's called a ratio, because that will be very clear in just a moment. OK, let me first answer the question, why is it called geometric? That's always something people ask at this point, so we might as well answer it. Why is it called geometric? Well, here's the idea. And it's a simple idea from your notions of geometry, after all. If you take a length of length r, then that is simply a unit measure of that length. If you then look at the two-dimensional square with sides r, then what is the area of that square? It is r squared, r times r. And then if we continue this process and we go up to a cube of side r, something like this, say, then the volume of this will be r cubed, and so on. And so you can see what's happening as we move from r, the length, to the area, to the volume, etc. We are multiplying each time by r, and that's a geometric growth, and that's where the geometry comes from. So it is m multiplication by r. All right. Now, why is, it called, why is the r called a common ratio? Well, notice, since we have this recursive definition, a n plus 1 equals a n times r, then you can see from that with a little algebra that you can solve for r. Then you can see immediately that r is simply a n plus 1 over a n. And we had a similar formula for the arithmetic sequence where we had a difference of the later and the earlier. Here we have the ratio of the two. And that's why this is called the common ratio, this r, because it's common. No matter which later term and immediately preceding term you take throughout the entire infinite geometric sequence, you will always get the same number r. If you don't, it's not a geometric sequence. So you might say that this is the later element over the earlier element. It helps to have a verbalization of this also. And of course, what does this give us? It gives us a test for whether a sequence is geometric. A test for whether a sequence is geometric. Because we simply take the later over the earlier for any two uh, numbers that are consecutive in the sequence. And if we get a constant, we know that the sequence is geometric. So let's use this test. Do a couple of examples here just to set the scene. Suppose we're looking at the sequence 2 to the minus n. Now, remember what that means, just for the record. That's 2 to the minus 1, 2 to the minus 2, et cetera, out to infinity. And the question is, is this geometric? In the sense of the definition we've just given. Well, the solution to this is quite easy. We just use the fact we just developed that if it is geometric, it has a common ratio. So we will take a n plus 1 over a sub n, the later over the earlier. Now what would be the later here? If this is 2, and remember we can think of this now as a box, so it's 2 to the minus box, we'll go up to the next stage which is 2 to the minus n plus 1 quantity. 
So 2 to the minus n plus 1. That is the very next element. That's the an plus 1 element over 2 to the minus n. Well, this is easy. The top can be simplified to 2 to the minus n plus 1 over 2 to the minus n. And of course, the 2 to the minus n divides in. We're left with 2 on the top. And I'm sorry, that's 2 to the minus n minus 1. Let me not forget that. Minus, the minus runs through here. So I have 2 to the minus 1. And of course, that is not 0. So that is the legitimate r here. And since there is an r, this is a geometric sequence. OK? So this is geometric because you get a constant here that doesn't depend on which two numbers you choose as long as they are consecutive members of the sequence. Now let's look at another example, which is a little different. Here is the sequence of the n factorials, which will be 1 factorial, 2 factorial, 3 factorial, and so on, out to infinity. And the question again, is this geometric? Well, once more, the solution is easy. We use exactly the same technique. Let's see what we get this time. A n plus 1 over A sub n. Here we have n plus 1 factorial over n factorial. Now n plus 1 factorial, remember how factorial is defined, is n plus 1 times n times n minus 1 all the way down to 2 times 1. Well, if I factor out the first factor, n plus 1, and you may remember the fact about this, n plus 1 factorial becomes n plus 1 times n factorial all over n factorial. Well, of course, n factorial over n factorial is 1, so we end up with n plus 1. Now, this is not a constant. So, not a geometric series. I'm sorry, geometric sequence. We'll be talking about geometric series in the next segment. This is not a geometric sequence because the, there is no common ratio. This is not a constant that doesn't change. It changes when n changes. So since it does, it's not a geometric sequence. Well, we've used the recursive definition of the geometric sequence. I said that we wanted to get to the stage of getting a direct formula for the nth term of a geometric sequence, just like we had one for the arithmetic sequence. And so here we are. The direct, as opposed to recursive, nth term formula, the direct nth term formula for a geometric sequence is what this particular theorem will be about a geometric sequence, okay? So let me box that in there. Then it goes like this. If we start off with a geometric sequence, so we suppose the a sub n's is a geometric sequence with the appropriate first term, which we will label a, and common ratio, common r for ratio, common ratio r, and that's non-zero, of course. Then what does the nth term look like? Well, you may be able to guess it based on what we've already seen. The nth term is a sub n equals a times r to the n minus 1 power. Please note that this power is 1 less than n, which is the term you're looking at. So in the nth term, it's a times r to the n minus 1. Well, where does this come from, and why is this in this form? Well, I won't do the whole proof, but I'll give you the proof idea, because it's easy to remember. Recall what the sequence was defined to be. The first term is a. Now, I'm going to write that as a times r to the 0 to make my point. The next one was a times r, which I'll write as a times r to the 1. And then you remember we had a times r squared, et cetera, out to infinity. Notice that this is exactly the form required for a sub 1. Because if we put 1 in here, we get r to the 0, and that would be a sub 1 equals a times r to the 0, which is what this is. 
and you see the next one has exactly the right form for a sub 2. If we put a 2 in here, 2 minus 1 is 1. That's a times r to the 1, and so on. So I think you see from the idea and the basic definition of a geometric sequence that this is indeed the right formula for a direct form. So with this formula, of course, if you know A and you know R, you can immediately write down the nth term. Let me do one little example here. Suppose you're given a geometric sequence, at least you're told it's geometric, and you're told that A is equal to 2 and that R is equal to 1 third. The question is, what is A sub n? So you're told only the first term what the common ratio is, and that the sequence is geometric. You'd like to know what the nth term looks like. Well, the solution here is to just use the theorem we just ended up writing down. a sub n by the theorem is a times r to the n minus 1. Well, here that is 2 times 1 third to the n minus 1, and there you go. That's the nth term. Now, sometimes when people have a fraction here to the n minus 1, they may want to rewrite that as 1 over 3 to the n minus 1 power. And that's really a matter of choice on your part. So there's the nth term which answers that question. Now, let me pose a little question to you to see if you understand the definition of the geometric sequence and a couple of the things we've talked about. Here's the problem. Find x now, and we'll assume here that x is not 0 or 1, so that the numbers x minus 1, x, and x plus 2 in order are terms in order of a geometric sequence. So you give that a try, and we'll be back soon. Now, before attempting to construct a geometric sequence for those terms, let's remember a couple of things so we can get our arguments started here. Remember, a geometric sequence, whatever it is, say a sub n's, has, by definition, a common ratio, which is some number r, some constant number, of course, r, that's non-zero, with, and we know where r comes from, r is equal to a n plus 1 over a n, and that's for any choice, for any n equal 1, 2, 3, all the way out to infinity. So there is the fact we remember about the geometric sequence. So we want what here? Let me bring the problem back so you can remember what we were talking about. Here is the original problem. We want these three numbers to be a part of a geometric sequence, which means, for example, that if we figure the common ratio from x over x minus 1, that should be the same common ratio we get by looking at x plus 2 over x, because it's supposed to be the same for the entire sequence. And that, of course, gives us an equation to solve. So we want x over x minus 1 to be our common ratio r, but that must simultaneously be the same one we get for x plus 2 over x. And you see, of course, by taking the two n's, we have an equation in x that we can solve. So here's what I'm going to do. I'll tell you along the way here. I'm going to multiply both sides by x minus 1 and by x. Because if I multiply both sides by x, the x in the bottom here will disappear, and I'll have a power of x up here. And if I multiply by x minus 1, it'll disappear from the denominator here and appear up here. In other words, I will have x squared is equal to x plus 2 times x minus 1. And then what I'm going to do is multiply this out. So I'll take x times x and then x times minus 1, 2 times x and then 2 times minus 1, which will take me to the next page. And I will end up, therefore, with x squared on the left equals, the multiplication gave me x squared minus x plus 2x minus 2 from the previous page. And of course, I can simplify this because notice I have x squared on both sides, which I can subtract away, and now that's gone. And I have 0 is equal to these two add to be x minus 2, so that means x is equal to 2. So 
although I've answered the question, I might as well write down the sequence terms. So the terms are, if you remember, they were x minus 1x and x plus 2. So with 2 in for x, we end up with 1, 2, and 4. And you can probably guess that the value of r that makes this a geometric sequence is also 2, and you can check that on your own. One last question I pose for you, and I'll just let you think about it. Question for you, why must x not be equal to 0 or 1? Now that was in the statement of the problem that it was not equal to 0 or 1. Why? I'll just let you think about that. Okay, let's go on to the, a theorem that will give us, just as we had for the arithmetic sequence, the nth partial sum. What happens when you add up the first n terms of a geometric sequence? Is there a nice formula for that? Well, the answer is yes, and here it is. The nth partial sum, the nth partial sum of a geometric sequence this time, and this is one that's interesting enough that I will show you the proof. Because as I said, the geometric sequences are much more important to us mathematically than the arithmetic sequences. So the nth partial sum of a geometric sequence goes like this. If, and again I have to give the uh, statement that if a n is a geometric sequence, okay, with the usual, first term A and common ratio, common R for ratio, R not equal to zero, then, and here's the formula, it's going to turn out to be quite nice later on, then its nth partial sum, if you add up the first n terms, is the following. Well, first, a common notation for this is S sub n, S standing for sum, n giving us the nth partial sum. And of course, the sum is, by definition, A plus AR plus all the way up to, where do we stop? Well, we go to AR n minus 1. Now, notice I'm not going to the nth term, because remember, we're starting with AR to the 0. So that's the first term. R to the 1 is really the second. So we have n minus 1 from these few, and then the 0 1 gives us the nth one. So we have the nth sum. And the formula, which I will prove in a moment, is a times the fraction 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. So there is the formula for the nth partial sum. And this works for all n, 1, 2, 3, etc. And r, which of course is non-zero by the above and by the definition of a geometric sequence, but also you note that since I'm dividing by 1 minus r, I have to eliminate 1 from this. Now is that a real problem? No, it's not. If we eliminate 1, the formula doesn't work for 1. However, if we wanted to add up the partial sums, the sum, partial sum would be easy. Because if r is 1, we just have a plus a plus a plus a plus a, n times, so we have n times a. So we don't need this nice formula in the case that r is equal to 1. So that's really not a loss. OK, I said I'd give you the proof. Let's go ahead and work that out now. It's very, very short, but I think it will be enlightening as we go. We will, first of all, write down the assumption that we're making that r is not equal to 0 or 1. And then once we've written that down, let's write down the following. First, let's write down s sub n. So S sub n is equal to A plus AR, and I'll put out a few terms here, plus AR squared, that's where the sum is, plus all the way up to, and I'll do the one second to the end, ARN minus 2 plus the last one, ARN minus 1. And it ends there, of course. That's the nth sum by definition. Now take this sum, which is a finite number, and multiply it all the way through by R. What happens? On the left, we have r times s sub n. And then a becomes a times r. a r becomes a r squared. a r squared becomes a r cubed, and so on. 
this term becomes a r n minus 1 plus a r to the n. So everything's gone up by 1. Now what I want to do is take this second row and subtract it from the first one. These are two finite numbers. I can do that. On the left, I get Sn minus R times Sn. So I just took these two and subtracted, just wrote it down. Uh, what happens on the right? Well, a very nice thing happens. First of all, there's an A up here, but there's no A down here. So the A will not be subtracted away. However, look at this. AR minus AR, these two add to 0. AR squared minus AR squared, these two add to 0. This pattern continues. AR n minus 1, AR minus AR n minus 1, these add to 0. So we're left with this term, which remember has a minus out front of it. So we have A minus AR to the n. So we have an expression that has no more dots in the middle, which is quite nice. Now on the left, we'll solve for S sub n. S sub n 1 minus R equals, and on this side, we'll pull out the A, A times 1 minus R to the n. And then I'll bring the 1 minus r underneath, which I can do because, remember, r is not equal to 1. So it's not equal to 1. That means 1 minus r is not 0. So I can divide. And I end up with s sub n is equal to a times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. And that's what I was trying to prove in this proof. So I've shown you now that the nth partial sum of a geometric sequence looks like this. That's a nice proof. Okay, well, let's practice this example. Find S sub n, the nth partial sum for the sequence 1 half to the nth power, which I tell you is geometric. You can check it easily, but I'll just tell you it's geometric so we don't have to do that here. And I want to now find the nth partial sum of that geometric sequence. Well, here, a is the first term, so it's 1 half to the 1, which is just 1 half. And how do I get r? Well, r is equal to 1 half to the n plus 1 over 1 half to the n, which, of course, is just 1 half, which is the same as the first term. So that means that S sub n is equal to, by the formula, a times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r, and let's substitute in what we have. So that's 1 half times 1 minus 1 half to the n all over 1 minus 1 half. Of course, on the bottom here, 1 minus 1 half is just 1 half, which will cancel with this 1 half. So they'll go away, and we'll just be left with 1 minus, and I'll write the 1 half to the n as 1 over 2 to the n, because that seems to be as common. And there we have it. That is the n sum, depending on what n is, that will be the value of s sub n. All right, that was just an example for the sake of practice. Now let me show you an example that is a classic. See, some examples are just famous. And so here's one. This is a classic. Imagine that we have a chessboard, or if you like, a checkerboard. And you remember how those are set up. They have, I won't draw the whole thing, but I'll show you the first part here. They consist of squares, and they are colored alternately, uh, red and black, or black and white, or any two colors, as long as they're different, like so. So this one will continue on down, that'll continue, that'll continue, etc. So that's what a checkerboard or a chessboard looks like. And the size of the chessboard I'm talking about is 8 by 8 which means that there are 64 squares. OK, here is the problem. And it has a, a bit of history. The problem seems to have come out of India. And apparently there was a man there, a mathematician, who did a favor for a king at some time. And the king said, I'll give you whatever you want. So the mathematician said, this is all I want. Take this chessboard, which is sitting in front of us. I would like one grain of rice placed on the first square two grains on the second, four on the third, eight on the fourth, and just keep doubling the number of grains until you've finished the entire board. And I'll accept that as my reward. 
So what was that request? That is to place 1, which I can also think of as 2 to the 0, grains of rice on the first square of the checkerboard, and then place 2, which I can interpret as 2 to the 1 grains of rice on the second square. And let's just go a little further. 4, which is 2 squared grains of rice on the third square. And maybe one more. 8 equals 2 cubed <coughs> on the fourth square. And then continue this until you finish the entire thing. Well, you notice that the 0 goes with the first square, the 1 with the second square. I guess I should do it this way. The 1 with the second, the second power to the third. So when I get to the 64th square, I will be putting on 2 to the 63 grains of rice on the 64th square. OK? And you notice the process that takes us from stage to stage is doubling. That's what the multiplication by 2 is. And the question then is, what is the total number of rice grains? OK, when we're done with all of this, what's the total number of rice grains? So we can decide whether the king would be happy or upset about having to fill up the checkerboard with a set of rice grains like this. Well, thinking of this as a geometric sequence, it's very easy to analyze this and use our nth partial sum formula. So the sequence that we have of grains of rice is 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, all the way up to 2 to the 63. And of course, that is geometric, as you see by its definition. But specifically, this is geometric with A, its first term being 2 to the 0, which is 1, and R being 2. This was doubling after all, so multiplying by 2 is the R. So with that in mind, what is S64? The sum of the first 64 terms. Well, that's 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus all the way up to 2 to the 63. And by the formula, remember the formula, may you write it over here, a times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. If we are adding up 64 things as we are doing here, with the a equal 1, we have 1 times 1 minus 2 to the 64th over 1 minus 2. And notice again that the power of r that ends the, uh, that is the final term in this sum is 63, whereas it is 64 for the formula. This is n, this is n minus 1. Well, 1 minus 2 is minus 1. And this 1 won't affect anything, so minus 1 times the top simply switches the order. And so we have 2 to the 64th minus 1. And that is the number of grains of rice. If you approximate that, it's about 1.84 times 10 to the 19th rice grains. So history does not tell us, but we are fairly sure that the king was not upset with this. Was, was, in fact, rather upset with this particular mathematician's request because this is far too many rice grains for the entire kingdom to provide. On that note, we'll stop here and we'll come back and we'll talk about geometric series. Mm -hmm.